Um, yeah, today I want to tell two stories from one well-known group of cyanotoxin and from one unknown cyanotoxin. So this is my fantastic group, quite a recent picture. You can see that we are all perfect one and a half meter apart. Uh, so yeah, safety first. Um, and this is just to acknowledge um, the funders that have supported our work over the years. Yeah, the talk will have two uh, parts. In the first part, I will talk a little bit about cyanobacterial specialized metabolites or natural products. And in the second part, I want to talk about two projects we are working on. This audience, I don't need to explain how cool cyanobacteria are. So I've simply thrown out all my slides introducing cyanobacteria in general. Um, you all know that cyanobacteria are ancient organisms around for more than 3 billion years that they have adapted to basically all habitats that we have marine, freshwater, terrestrial strains. We find them in hot springs and Arctic lakes. So I don't need to tell you that, but it's quite important to keep that in mind because if an organism has been around for a long time and has adapted to basically all habitats there are on Earth, then this means that this organism has evolved means to compete with other organisms. And this is quite often done by natural products or specialized metabolites. Cyanobacteria are old, they are found everywhere. So you might think that they produce interesting natural products. And this is indeed the case. Cyanobacteria are now, now recognized as organisms that produce unique and diverse natural products. Here are just some of the interesting compounds you find in cyanobacteria. For us, the most interesting thing is that only a small proportion of cyanobacterial species and compounds have been characterized to date. This is, of course, very interesting for us, makes life a little bit easier. If you compare the number of cyanobacterial metabolites that are known, you come to like 2,000 something metabolites that are known. And if you compare that to plants, where we know tens of thousands of compounds or actinized seeds, microscopic fungi, where we know like 10 or 15,000 compounds, this makes life for us easier because the chance to find something new in cyanobacteria is higher than if you work with plants or fungi. So why are we interested in natural products? This brings me to one of my favorite slides. Here on the left, you can see all the approved drug substances we have on the market. And about half of these are natural products or inspired by natural products. So natural products have evolved to be active. Maybe we don't know why they have evolved, but they must have some activity because it takes energy to produce them and to keep these genes in the genomes. So natural products are very likely to have some biological activity and about half of the drugs we have on the market are inspired by natural products. If you go into the fields of anti-infective or anti-cancer drugs, then it's even more. Three out of four compounds on the markets are derived from natural products. So we as pharmacists are always interested in bioactive natural products. We can maybe develop into drugs. So if you take a look on natural products from cyanobacteria, you will see, as I've already shown, they are structurally quite diverse, but we very often find lipopeptides in them. I've brought two examples here. Um, this is a cyclic lipopeptide, a microcystine. You can see here the lipid part of the molecule, which is derived from polyketide synthesis. And here you have the peptidic part of the molecule. Uh, you see all these peptide bonds here and here and here, uh, which is derived from non-ribosomal peptide synthesis. We have cyclic peptides, we have linear peptides. Um, and the interesting thing about these compound families is that we find a very high natural variability in these compound families. For example, the microcystines, we know more than 300 natural microcystines that are produced by cyanobacteria. In the case of the microgenins, we have more than 80 known compounds. So it's a very high variability in these compound families that have certain structures that make them characteristic. I will come to the microcystines later in this talk. What we very often see in um, cyanobacterial natural product bioactivities is cytotoxicity or protease inhibition. Not only cytotoxicity or protease inhibition, but these are observed very often. And there's one famous natural product with extreme cytotoxicity that I will now present to you because it's such a fascinating story. Uh, the story of the dolastatins. 
In the 70s, um, the National Cancer Institute in the United States has made it their aim to defeat cancer, to find cures for cancer. So they set up a huge screening for natural products that are of potential use in anti-cancer therapy. And they screened really hundreds of thousands of um, extracts from plants, fungi, bacteria, whatever you find, everything, also animals. And in the early 70s, they identified an extract from this sea slug, Seaher Dolabella auricularia, as extremely cytotoxic. Um, Dolabella auricularia is a, a sea slug about half a meter long in its natural environment. And um, an extract from this organism was extremely cytotoxic. And it took 15 years to isolate the active compounds from the sea slug because it was only in so low yield present in, in this extract. It took 1,000 kilogram of the sea slug to be extracted to obtain just enough material for structure elucidation. And structure elucidation showed that this active compound was this linear peptide, uh, which was called dolastatin after this um, sea slug dolabella auricularia. So why do I tell the story of the sea slug? The dolastatins have been rediscovered in 2001 in a cyanobacterium. And in fact, it was later realized that the cyanobacterium is the real producer of this compound, uh, that the compounds come from um, these marine cyanobacteria of the genus Simploca, Dolabella is simply grazing on. So people back then have not extracted the sea slug, but kind of the gut content of this sea slug. So at the time of the discovery, these dolastatins were the most potent cytotoxic compounds with IC50 values in the low nanomolar range, so extreme cytotoxicity. Because of this high activity, um, they were studied in more detail. It was found that they are able to destabilize the microtubuli, similar to other natural products we have on the market against cancer. And they were very quickly introduced in clinical studies. And Sadly, it was found that um, these dolastatins have a very high toxicity, especially neurotoxicity and hematotoxicity, and that they are inefficient uh, against the cancers they were tested against. So it happened as it is always the case, if you have a natural product with excellent activity, which is not suitable for use in humans, um, you give this natural product to a synthetic chemist, to a medicinal chemist, and uh, tell them, okay, find me some better derivatives. And they synthesize hundreds of derivatives and it will be tested which of these might have better properties. So this was the case here as well. Um, you can see here two of these synthetic derivatives, tazidotin based on dolastatin 15 and sobilidotin based on dolastatin 10. Here you see the natural products, here you see the synthetic compounds, you can see the differences are really small. These two compounds were still very potent, IC50 in the low nanomolar range. They were, in contrast to the natural products, very well tolerated, which was really an advantage, but they were also really inefficient. Limited success as, as single agents, so they were kind of dropped. Um, the clinical trials were not continued. But then some researchers had another idea. Um, they thought about, okay, which of these compounds is the most toxic? And they came to this compound, monometryl aristatin E. And this compound can be coupled via a spacer and a linker to a monoclonal antibody. And this antibody can be targeted against a cancer cell-specific surface antigen. And this is depicted here. You have here the antibody with the drug, symbolized by these green symbols. And this antibody now targets an antigen that is only found on cancer cell surfaces. And if this antibody now binds to its antigen, the whole complex is internalized into the cell and degraded inside the lysosome. And then when the antibody is degraded, the cytotoxic drug is released in the cancer cell, allowing a targeted treatment of cancer cells only if you're able to find a cancer-specific surface antigen. The antibody itself is quite stable in the blood plasma, so it is not degraded if it is um, outside of the cancer cell, but inside the lysosome, it is then degraded. This was indeed the first cyanobacterial natural product-based drug that has been approved 10 years ago. Uh, this antibody has been approved by the FDA. The trade name is Acetris, and this is a drug that is now used against uh, some lymphoma types. 
Now you can of course select other monoclonal antibodies and couple them with this cytotoxic drug. And this is indeed the case. There are now several different antibodies in several phases of the clinical trials so that this monomethyl oristatin E can also be used against other cancer types than these lymphomas. This is a story I really like because it shows you how kind of complicated natural product research can be. Um, this is a story that uh, industry does not want to hear because it took 40 years to develop the product. This is not really the time scale industry wants to think in. Also, it's not a direct way. I mean, it was from the cyanobacterium into the sea slug, from then to total synthesis, then this coupling to a monoclonal antibody. So it is a very complicated development, but it shows that perseverance and patience can pay off. Moving on to our own projects. The first project I want to discuss is microcystins as leads for drug substances. This is a project that we started while I was still employed at Sinobiotech, a small biotech company based in Berlin in Germany. And yeah, we were really trying to identify natural products from cyanobacteria as leads for different illnesses. And I want to present now the microcystin project. Many of you will know microcystins. As I already showed you, they are these cyclic peptides. Here is the structure of microcystin LR. LR because it contains leucine in this position and arginine R in this position. So this microcystin LR, the LR kind of gives you an indication about the structure of this compound. Microcystins are found in a lot of cyanobacterial genera, uh, microcystis, Nostoc anavina, Oscillatoria planktotrix, very different cyanobacteria are able to produce microcystins. Now, I already told you that um, we know more than 300 natural congeners of this uh, family. Um, all these compounds have in common this polyketide-derived amino acid, which is abbreviated as ADA but they differ in the other amino acids. Um, the size of these amino acids is proportional to the probability of this amino acid in the molecule. So how often do you find this amino acid in this position? And you will see that there are positions like this one where you don't really have a high variability in the amino acids, but that in other positions, like in this one, you find a lot of different amino acids that can be incorporated by the enzymes um, into this position. Especially these positions two and four are very variable. The microcystins are best known for their toxicity. You all know that harmful algal blooms are an issue in a lot of lakes and, and other water bodies. And the microcystins are the toxins you find most often in these harmful algal blooms. There are, of course, because microcystins are, are toxic health implications for wildlife, cattle, and, and also humans. Almost every algal bloom season, you find reports about dogs dying after they played on the shore of, of some lakes, drank water, or ate the scum. But it is also known that um, humans died because of microcystins. They are also suspected to cause liver cancer, open chronic exposure, and uh, the World Health Organization has limited the concentration of microcystines in drinking water to one microgram per liter, which is quite a low concentration. Because microcystines have such a huge importance in harmful algal blooms, they are, I would say, the best studied cyanobacterial metabolites. We know their mechanism of action. We know they are inhibitors of eukaryotic protein phosphatases, two different kinds of these phosphatases, 1 and 2A. And these are very important for cell signaling pathways and also maintenance, cytoskeleton maintenance. So if you inhibit these phosphatases, you kind of interrupt all the signaling pathways in the cells, the maintenance pathways, so you kill the cells. Now, microcystins are known as liver toxins, and you may wonder why they are liver toxins because we find these protein phosphatases in all living cells. So they should be toxic to all living cells and not just for liver cells. This is because microcystines cannot passively enter cells. They have a very low membrane penetrating capacity. So they need actively being taken up before they can be toxic. And this active uptake is done by so-called organic onion transporting polypeptides, or in short, OATP. The liver is the organ in our body which is responsible for getting rid of all the compounds we take up, we eat, but the body does not need. 
So the liver has a lot of these transporters filtering all xenobiotics, all the stuff we have in our blood out of the bloodstream, so it can't harm us. This is normally good because these compounds don't intoxicate us, but in the case of the microcystines, the liver takes up these microcystines and then the liver cells die. There are a huge number of transporters in the liver and the microcystines can be transported by basically two different transporters, OATP1B1 and 1B3. These are, you will not be surprised, exclusively found in the liver. So this is why microcystines are toxic only for liver cells. And you can see that this transporter, OATP1B1, is much more often present in liver than this transporter, OATP1B3. This is the case in healthy humans, but it has been found that this transporter, OATP1B3, is also expressed in some cancer tissues especially breast tumors and colon tumors, and have a high expression of this transporter. Nobody knows why, but this is just the case. So we had the idea that maybe there are microcystin derivatives that are preferentially transported by this transporter, which we don't really often find on liver cells, but which is present in cancer tissue, and not so much by this OATP1B1, which is very present in high abundance on liver cells. So if we have a microcystin that is selectively transported by this transporter, we might create a therapeutic window for these microcystins. So a collaboration partner of ours, Jeff Moskow, at the University in Lexington in Kentucky, developed some cell lines which expressed these two transporters that we could use to study the uptake and toxicity of microcystins in vitro, in, in these cell lines. And we did an initial study with the most common microcystines concerning both the potency against these cell lines and the selectivity, which transporter transports them better. So these are the most commonly found microcystines LR, RR, and YR. And you can uh, see here the toxicity against cells that express this liver transporter. Here is the activity against cells that express this cancer transporter and you can simply calculate then some selectivity ratio. And you can see that indeed these three microcystines have a huge difference um, in their cytotoxicity. LR, for example, is very potent, low nanomolar activity, but it's more active against the liver transporter uh, carrying cells. Microcystine RR, in contrast, is much less active, but it seems to be more active against cells expressing this OATP1B3 transporter. And I think this is really fascinating if you take a look at the structure of these three compounds, because it's just this amino acid here which makes the difference, either leucine, arginine, or tyrosine. So small differences can have large impacts. So we wondered, really, are there more selective potent microsystems? So Sinobiotech has a large stain collection, and I went into this collection and checked whether we can isolate other microcystine derivatives. And indeed, I could isolate about 25 different microcystine uh, variants, and they were tested in this assay, elucidated the structure of all these compounds uh, so that we can, could deduce some structure activity relationships. And it was really interesting to see the results because some microcystine derivatives were highly potent, but not selective at all. Nodularine, which is closely related to the microcystins, was really active, but had exactly the wrong selectivity. So it was more active against cells expressing this liver type transporter. But we also found three congeners that were both active in the low nanomolar range and more toxic against cells expressing this OATP1B3. So we felt some confirmation that our idea was, was working. And our collaboration partner, Jeff Moscow, then um, took the most selective congener and brought it into mice that where a tumor was grown that expressed these transporters. But sadly, in this xenograft model in mice, we didn't see inhibition of the tumor growth, and even our best microcystines were still very hepatotoxic. So um, we were a little bit discouraged by th these results, but we applied for funding and started this project where we wanted to generate more specifically transported microcystines. Um, we had several strategies. We wanted to isolate just more natural microcystines. We wanted to manipulate the microcystine biosynthesis, and we wanted to feed non-natural amino acids. This is work that I will now present because these two strategies didn't work at all. 
And the work I now present um, has been performed by Julia Moschny, who uh, finished her PhD last year and is now postdoc at the University of Tübingen. So you will remember that we have this very high flexibility in positions two and four of the microcystines. And this is because the enzymes that catalyze the formation of these compounds are kind of sloppy. They are not selective for one amino acid, but they can incorporate also structurally related amino acids. So for example, if you feed a strain that is producing this microcystine YR, these unnatural amino acids, meaning you simply give them into the cultivation medium, then, for example, this chlorotyrosine or this metoxytyrosine is incorporated instead of this tyrosine here in position two. If you feed this homoarginine, it will be incorporated instead of arginine. So this works really well. And we generated unnatural, natural products this way. And then we had another idea because the strains were so flexible, accepting unnatural substrates, we thought about feeding these two amino acids. And as you can see, these are also structurally closely related to the tyrosine found here in position two. And these contain a very interesting or two very interesting functional groups, this propagyl group here or this azido group here. And this also works as expected. We get uh, microcystines containing this azido group or this uh, propagyl group here. So why are these compounds interesting? Because you can do chemistry with them. Chemistry you can even do if you're a stupid biologist as we are. This is a chemistry called click chemistry because it's so easy. It's like clicking two things together and here you go. You can call it click chemistry, but you can also call it copper catalyzed uh, azide alkyne cycloaddition, which sounds a little bit more fashy. So if you have such an azide and an alkyne, you can click these two together in this copper catalyzed reaction um, so that you have one molecule which is yeah, connected via this triazole bridge. And this reaction, as I said, is really easy. You can do it as a one pot reaction. You can do it under very mild reaction conditions in water. It's very selective. So only azides and alkynes react with each other. So it's a very convenient reaction. And we now can use these clickable microcystines to connect whatever we basically want to this microcystine using this clickable functional group. So for example, we can now study in more detail the natural functions of these toxin or their mode of action, or we can attach other compounds to this microcystine. So the first thing Julia has done was attaching a fluorophore to the microcystines. This coumarin is not fluorescent if it is not yet clicked, but as soon as it is a clicked compound, it begins to uh, fluorescent in a wonderful bluish color. So we were interested if um, this chemical modification of the microcystine has an impact on the cytotoxicity of these compounds. So we tested the natural microcystine YR, the clickable microcystine, and the fluorescent microcystine against the cell lines expressing these transporters. You still, of course, need uptake of these compounds into the cell, so you need to use these cell lines expressing these transporters. And the black line here is the natural microcystine, the red line is the clickable microcystine, and the blue line is the fluorescent microcystine. And you will see, yeah, of course, you will see some differences, but it's biology, you always have differences, so it's basically the same. It's the same activity range for all three compounds, meaning they are both taken up by the transporter and also still active against the protein phosphatases, which are their targets. So then we wondered if these compounds are taken up by the cells, is this a rapid process or does it take some time? Maybe we can even see where the compounds are located after uptake. So we did some time-lapse microscopy and in the following video, you will see it's all black at first. Then we add the my fluorescent microsystem at time point zero. And then you can see distribution of the microcystine into the cell if it is taken up. And you would expect to see some uptake in this cell because it expresses the transporter, but not in this cell because it does not express the transporter. And here's what happens. So now we have the microcystine and you can see that it's really rapidly taken up into the cells. 
Uh, you can't really say where it is located in the cell because the setup was not ideal. When we added the microsystem, the cells were detached from the microtata plate bottom and, and started to float. So these images are a little bit blurry, but still you can see that it's really a rapid process and that no microsystem is taken up in the control cells. You can quantify that and measure the, the fluorescence in this area. And you can see that after 10 minutes, the microsystem has been more or less completely taken up into the cell. This was really a surprise because we had not expected this to be such a rapid process. Now, you remember what I told you about these antibody drug conjugates? You can also use these clickable microcystines to attach them to an antibody because you can simply use this click functionality to bring it to reaction with the respective click functionality in an antibody so that you can deliver a microcystine in a targeted way to a cancer cell. And this is a project we are currently working on. Lava Stock, PhD student in my group, is focusing on this topic. So you might wonder why are microcystins interesting as drugs in these antibody drug conjugates? And they are really attractive because on one hand, they are extremely potent. As I told you, low nanomolar to picomolar activities. And you need a high potency of a drug in these antibody drug conjugates because you only get a low amount of compound into the cell, and these then must be very potent. And microcystines are extremely potent. They have a novel mode of action, which is phosphatase inhibition, and novel mode of actions are always beneficial. Resistance development is very unlikely because the target is essential in the cell, a protein phosphatase. The cell can't live without protein phosphatases. And the microcystines target two different protein phosphatases. So resistance development is quite unlikely. And I think the most interesting aspect is that if you have a microcystin congener attached to an antibody that is not transported by these transporters, these have a low off-target toxicity. The problem with the antibody drug conjugates currently in the clinic is that some of the toxic drug is already released in the bloodstream. Or if the cancer cell dies, the toxic molecule is released into the healthy environment of the cancer. So if you have a microcystine that is not transported, then you have no means for this microcystine to get into a cell, except if it is still linked to this antibody. So this might be an interesting approach to generate microcystine-based antibody drug conjugates. Indeed, we have a collaboration with two partners in the pharmaceutical industry who already have coupled microcystines to antibodies. Uh, I sadly cannot show you any results because I'm not allowed to, but maybe when we meet next time, I can present you very interesting data on these antibody drug conjugates. I think it's, it's very promising what we have achieved to date. Yeah, from this very well-known cyanotoxin, I want to move on to a novel cyanotoxin. And this is finally also a project that I started when I was still employee of Cyanobiotech. I started this project 10 years ago. The project grew and grew and grew. And in the end, we were more than 25 partners from different institutes in, in various nations. And yeah, as Ilka already said, this came out two months ago at the cover story at Science. This story is about a disease called avian vacuola myelinopathy, or in short, AVM. Let's go 21 years uh, back. Uh, this disease was first described in 1998 as a fatal neurological disease affecting birds. We now know that it also affects other animals than birds, so we prefer to call it vacuola myelinopathy, or VM, because it's not only targeting birds. So this, this publication in 1998 was the first publication describing this um, disease. In 1994, it was observed that about half of the bald eagles wintering at a certain lake in Arkansas in the USA had died from a mysterious disease. Here you can see a bird that is obviously dead, and here you can see a bird with drooping wings. And I mean, bald eagles, they are really majestic and, and energetic birds. And, to have one of these birds with its wings like that is, is, I think, a very sad thing to see. So it's a bald eagle, it's a national um, symbol of the US, the iconic bird. So people, of course, wondered what caused these mortalities. And you might know that the bald eagle was an endangered species some decades ago uh, due to various factors like lead from hunters or dioxin as an environmental pollutant. But all these causes that were known to cause bald eagle die-offs were not found in, in these cases. So it was an undiagnosed die-off. 
what was very characteristic for these eagles was that they had lesions in the white matter of the brain. Here you can see a brain section of a healthy eagle. Everything is looking nice and smoothly. And here you can see a brain section of an affected eagle and you see these white lesions, these holes in the brain of affected birds, which are particularly severe in the optic lobe of the brain. So these vacuoles are formed by separation of the myelin sheaths surrounding the axons. And this sometimes happens in infectious diseases, um, but no infectious disease was found in this case. No inflammatory cells were observable and also the uh, disease was found to be not transmissible. So they put affected birds next to healthy birds and they didn't catch the disease, so it was not transmissible. So what are the clinical signs of this uh, disease? You can imagine having holes in your brain is not really beneficial. One thing that is really impressive is the impairment of motor function. Birds get unable to move, to fly, to swim, they get lethargic. And um, here I have a, a video of affected coots, and you can see the, the, this left bird, for example, flapping its wings and, and just moving its, its leg a little bit. These birds are not able to feed, they are vulnerable to environmental stresses like cold, and they can't escape if some predator approaches, like the bald eagle. It was very interesting to see that this disease seemed to be site-specific, so only at certain lakes this disease occurred, and it was also seasonal. Only from, yeah, say, October, November, December, you found dead birds around these specific water bodies. But over the years, this disease was observed more and more frequently. It seemed to spread, maybe only because the, the people, the rangers, scientists really looked into it, uh, but it seemed to, to spread. As I said, no link to known toxicants could be made. But over the years, it was um, found that not only bald eagles and coots, but also other animals were affected from this disease, both water birds and also birds of prey. Our collaboration partner, Susan Weil, from the University of Athens in Georgia, was one of the early scientists working on this disease. And she found that in water bodies where this mysterious disease occurs, you very often find hydrants population of hydrilla in these lakes. Hydrilla verticillata is an aqueous plant uh, which is invasive in the US. It's native to the Southeast Asia and has been introduced into the USA as an aquarium plant. Some guy put his aquarium into some lake and from there the plant spread over the country. And she observed that only in, in water bodies where you found dense hydrilla growth, you also observed this mysterious disease. A year later, she found that it's not the plant actually that seems to cause this disease because there were water bodies where the plant grew, but no birds fell sick. But when she, she examined this plant a little bit closer, she found these um, dark blotches, spots on the leaves of the plant. And these are cyanobacterial colonies growing on the leaf of the invasive plant hydrilla. This is a figure from our publication, and this is really a lot of field work uh, which has been done and, and summarized in this simple figure. Uh, what you can see here is the southeast of the USA. In green, you find the watersheds where this invasive plant, Hydrilla, has been observed. In yellow, you find water bodies that or watersheds where hydrilla is growing that have been sampled by Susan or her colleagues and where the cyanobacterium growing on the leaves has not been observed. The red ones are watersheds where the cyanobacterium grows on hydrilla and the hatched areas are watersheds where avian vacuolar myelinopathy has been observed. And you can see there's a clear correlation between the occurrence of this disease and the presence of the cyanobacterium growing on hydrilla verticillata. Of course, you also have regions where the cyanobacterium is not present, but you still find dead birds. Uh, but I mean, these birds are moving from one watershed to the other. And maybe some bird has consumed water plant with cyanobacterium here, then moved a little bit. And so you will find it dead here, although the cyanobacterium is not found in this watershed. But you can see a clear correlation between these two factors. She then tested this hypothesis and extracted the plant with the cyanobacterium growing on top and fed these extracts to birds. And these birds were indeed then found to develop these brain lesions. Uh, so she concluded that there must be an extractable inducing agent in these plants or cyanobacteria. 
So this was then 2011, the time when I kind of joined the project. Um, I was very new to Cyanobacteria Natural Products. Um, I was just starting to work at this company and I wanted to get an overview about Cyanobacteria Natural Products and especially Cyanotoxins. So I used Google to uh, check what Cyanotoxins are, are out there. Uh, yeah, I, I was working in the industry, so I didn't have um, proper literature databases and I had to use Google and this blog post about this cyanotoxin in, in Apple's nails was one of the hits Google brought up. And I read through the story and it really was uh, fascinating because it basically told you what I've just told you. There's this lamp, there's this cyanobacterium, eagles are dying, also the bald eagle and Susan Wilde from the University in Georgia uh, was studying this phenomenon. So I really like the bald eagle. So I was kind of moved by this story. And why was I in, in love with the bald eagle? As a young kid, um, I was on holidays with my parents. And I don't know if, if you know that um, in, in Germany, we have these ruins of medieval castles and there are always these shows with birds of prey. So some guy has some falcons or whatever birds of prey and shows you how the lords and ladies in, in medieval times used them to hunt for small animals. So I was at one of these shows and the falconer showed us whatever he wanted to show us. And afterwards, we were invited to come forward and take these birds on our arms. And there was one bald eagle I, I was allowed to take on my arm. And I really remember as if it was yesterday, this proud, heavy bird looking at me and I was looking back and it was like, oh, wow. Um, so yeah, it was about the bald eagle. And, and then I called my mother and, and asked her if um, she had taken a photo back then, because maybe I'm starting a bald eagle project. And she said, maybe I will look. And yeah, well, this is me, 12 years old, holding this bald eagle. <laughs> sadly, sadly, you know, back then you couldn't check <laughs> if the photo was okay. But yeah, anyway, it's, it's great. So I, I contacted Susan Wilde and um, asked her whether she already knew which cytotoxin was causing this disease. And she said, no, she, she doesn't know yet. And she's not an expert in, in natural products, so she has no idea what to do. So I offered my help, asked her if we could do the isolation and structure elucidation, hoping it would be a quick project. Yeah, so she sent us some leaves of hydrilla with the cyanobacterium and also um, some isolated colonies. And this was one colony she had uh, isolated from a leaf. And this is uh, the same colony after a few months, and you can see it's extremely slowly growing. We needed months and months to cultivate a tiny amount of the cyanobacterium. Uh, so we worked really hard to optimize the cultivation conditions, added vitamins, soil extract, whatever, changed salt concentrations and so on. Uh, so we kind of convinced the cyanobacterium to grow a little bit faster, but it was still a pain. And this was everything we had after more than one year of cultivation. So, but after two years, we had enough biomass accumulated um, for an avian bioassay, and we, we sent this biomass to Susan for confirmation that the cyanobacterium contains the toxin that is eliciting this disease. Uh, but sadly, this trial was negative. So um, we had worked for years, and um, the cyanobacterial biomass we had produced was not toxic for the birds. So we didn't really know what to do. We tried changing cultivation conditions, whatever. Nothing uh, helped, but in the meantime, scientists found that this disease can also affect fish, turtles, Daphnia. Um, the cyanobacterium was characterized as a novel genus and species and called Etoctonus hydrilicola, which is a beautiful name because it comes from the Greek and means eagle killer living on hydrilla. So uh, I think this is so poetic, but it's also a little bit risky because we had not shown yet that this cyanobacterium is really an eagle killer. We had a wonderful ecological food web, um, the cyanobacterium grows on hydrilla, hydrilla is eaten by birds, by turtles, by fish, by snails, these are then eaten by birds of prey. So it must have been the cyanobacterium, but we couldn't make the cyanobacterium toxic in our lab. National Geographic had this um, story, deadly brain disease is driving swamp birds insane. And I thought, yeah, it's driving swamp birds insane and us as well. So we had no clue. In 2014, I moved back to academia, joined the University of Tübingen, and I wanted to revive this project. And I applied for funding three times, um, was not successful. So we couldn't really follow up on this project. The most funny uh, review comment was, oh, maybe this compound is toxic. Uh, maybe it's dangerous to work with it. You can't fund this project. And I was like, oh, okay, we know what we are doing. Yes, it is toxic. That's why we want to isolate it. But anyway. In 2017, I moved uh, to the University of Halle, and this changed things a little bit because on one hand, I had funding for a PhD student. I could put on this project, this was Steffen Breininger, 
who is also a shared first author of our science publication. And the university has granted me some funding to apply for large um, instruments. And I'm very fascinated by mass spectrometry. And I, I wanted to buy an imaging mass spectrometer. I don't know if you know this technique. It's quite fascinating. You have a tissue and you can cover this tissue with a Maldi matrix and then use a laser to shoot at this tissue and record the masses of the compounds that are present in this precise location. And then you can raster this tissue and then use dedicated software to later assemble all these individual pixels and then tell the software, okay, show me where whatever mass is and then you get these false color images showing you where specific masses are located on your sample. Or you can say the software, okay, take a look at this region. Are there any masses that are different from other regions of the sample? And this is what we did. Here you can see a, a micrograph of a hydrilla leaf. Uh, you can here see the, the outline of the leaf, fluorescing red above the black background. And you can see here the, the brightly fluorescing cyanobacterial colonies. And we hypothesized that maybe in their natural environment, in the lakes, the cyanobacteria produce a compound they do not produce in our lab. So we took this leaf and prepared the sample and analyzed it using mass spec imaging. And then we looked at regions and tried to find out, are there masses in this region that are different from masses in this region? So cyanobacterial colony, leaf background. Uh, this is how it looked like. The red mass spectrum is this red area, leaf only, and the blue mass spectrum is the blue area, cyanobacterial colony. And you can see that a lot of these compounds are present in both the cyanobacterial colony and the leaf, but there are some peaks that are present only in the cyanobacterial colony. And this is a fascinating mass spectrum. We will come to that in a second. So you can, of course, tell the software, okay, show me where this mass is, and you get an image uh, like that. And then you can overlay these two images to an image like this, and you can see, okay, this compound seems to be located only where cyanobacteria are. Of course, there are also cyanobacterial colonies where you do not find this compound, but again, that's biology. At least you find this compound only in the cyano colonies. So coming back to this mass spectrum, or better said, this isotope pattern, because if you're a mass spectrometrist, you will immediately see that um, this is the isotope pattern of a compound that contains halogen atoms. And you can use the accurate mass of this um, analysis to determine the sum formula of this compound. And it was, as shown here, a molecule containing five bromine atoms. What you then usually do is check the databases. Is this an already known compound? And to our delight, it was not. So this is a novel natural product, not in the databases. It is known or has been known that polyhydrogenated compounds elicit VM-like lesions in brains of animals. For example, this compound here, the rodenticide bromethylin, is known to cause lesions in the white matter of the brain of cats, for example, which accidentally consume this rodenticide. Also, hexachlorophane, a disinfectant, is known to cause lesions in the white matter of the brain. And we thought, okay, we have a lot of halogens, they have a lot of halogens, maybe it's similar. And then we suddenly knew why our lab cultures did not produce this compound. Because in the cultivation medium we used in the lab, standard BG11, we don't have any bromide available. But bromide is needed for biosynthesis of this compound. So we took a culture of our lab strain and just supplemented a tiny little bit of bromide into the cultivation medium. This is the chromatogram of the extract without bromide supplementation. And this is the chromatogram of the extract with bromide supplementation. And this is exactly the compound we could see on the leaves. So this was quite encouraging. And you can also see it's quite a large amount of the compound here and, and nothing at all in the strain cultivated in BG11. So we took some biomass from the field that did not cause AVM and compared it with biomass causing AVM. And now that we knew what we were maybe looking for, we found this compound in biomass causing VM, but not in biomass not causing VM. So this again strengthened our hypothesis that this compound might be involved in VM formation. Then we also took a look at seasonal variation um, of this compound in biomass collected from the lakes. And we found that the seasonal variation of the toxin correlated with a VM occurrence in birds. Here, for example, in July, so summer, you don't find the toxin in biomass collected from lakes. In September, you find a tiny little bit, but in November, you really find a lot of this compound in the biomass. So the seasonal variation also fits. 
Then we took tissue of deceased coots and analyzed it for the toxin. And indeed, we could find this toxin in breast and tight tissue. Um, these are a little bit fatty tissues. The compound is quite lipophilic, so this makes sense. Then we microfractionated an extract of the cyanobacterium with this compound. Microfractionation means you uh, simply fractionate every minute, collect whatever comes off from the column uh, in HPLC, and then you can do a bioassay with this. And uh, we found that only this fraction was toxic to Daphnia. And then we were pretty sure that this must be our putative toxin. So we made a larger scale isolation of this compound. Natural products chemists will realize that this is a sum formula from a compound that is very challenging to elucidate because it contains only few protons and you need a lot of protons to do proper NMR analysis. So we needed a lot of this compound to do quite exotic NMR experiments and I will not bother you with the details. We did some extensive analysis of this compound. In the end, X-ray crystallography proved the structure of the compound, which I now proudly present. This is etoctonotoxin, Greek for poison that kills the eagle. And this is really a, a quite spectacular structure in the eyes of a natural product chemist, at least, because you have these five bromine atoms, which we already knew, but then you have these two indoor moieties, which are connected in a way that has not been observed in any natural product before. And you have this uh, nitrile functional group here in this position that has been only found in one other natural product before. So this is quite an uncommon structure for a natural product. Of course, we were interested in its activity, so we tested um, toxicity against C. elegans and also zebrafish. And we found this compound to be really toxic. Two-digit or three-digit nanomolar concentrations were enough to uh, kill the elegans or, or the zebrafish. So um, we fed this compound to birds, or Susan did this. We are not really working with animals, but, but Susan is really an expert in this. And she fed this to birds. And this is a control. These birds didn't get anything. These birds were fed with Hydrilla and autochthonous biomass, which was known to cause VM, like a positive control. And this was the pure compound autochthonotoxin. And you can see it's not discriminable to true AVM. So uh, this was proof we had identified the toxin causing vacuolar myelin lipopathy. We were also interested in the biosynthesis of this um, intriguing molecule because it's so unique. So our collaboration partners at the Czech Academy of Science, uh, led by Jan Maresch, uh, studied uh, the biosynthesis. They sequenced the genome of the strain and uh, rapidly could identify the biosynthetic gene cluster responsible for producing this compound. Very obvious because it contained these two halogenases, which are responsible for the incorporation of these halogen atoms. They were uh, able to express one of these halogenases in E. coli, and we did biochemical assays with this halogenase and found that it indeed was able to brominate tryptophan. So we added tryptophan. Inactive enzyme did nothing with the tryptophan, but the active enzyme produced two compounds, which were 5-bromotryptophan and 5,7-bromotryptophan, exactly the halogenation pattern you find here. So you might wonder where this bromide comes from because it's a freshwater cyanobacterium and bromide concentration in freshwater are not really high. We don't know that yet. It might be of geologic origin, but it might also be of anthropogenic origin. Coal, for example, coal firing power plants. The coal uh, in these regions of the US is often treated with bromides to capture quicksilver, and these wastes are then discarded, introducing bromide into the environment but also water treatment might be an issue. Uh, I told you that hydrilla is an invasive plant and this is really a problem in these areas. So the authorities try to treat lakes that are infested with uh, hydrilla. And one strategy is to use herbicides. They, they pour herbicides into the lakes in the hope that it kills the, the hydrilla. And uh, one of these herbicides contains bromide as a counter ion, dequat dibromide. So this might also be a source of the bromide, but also fuel additives or um, wastes from the flame retardant industry might be the reason. But still the concentrations in water should not be that high. So we analyzed water of VM uh, affected lakes and we found that indeed the concentration of bromide in water is very low. In the sediment, it was higher, but especially high, it was in hydrilla. So the plant seems to be able to enrich bromide from the environment. It's a 20-fold enrichment. So it kind of gives the cyanobacterium a bromide-enriched environment in which it can then produce the toxin. 
Yeah, that already brings me to the end. We've been working on this project for like 10 years, but it feels as if we just started because there are so many open questions now. We saw that we have a seasonal fluctuation in toxin production, but why? What environmental factors are driving toxin production? How is the biosynthesis regulated? We have observed that, for example, a temperature drop or agitation of the culture stimulates production of this toxin. How is this working? What enzymes are involved in this biosynthesis other than the halogenases? Where does the bromide come from? What else is autochthonous producing? This is a question that the PhD student Markus Schwark is trying to answer. We want to study if there's an interaction between the plant and cyanob the cyanobacterium. And of course, we need to answer the question whether this toxin is also dangerous for mammals. We have not yet shown that yet. We have found toxicity in birds and fish and turtles. These are all kind of ancient organisms. And we don't know if mammals are affected as well. And of course, we, we want to know the mode of action of this compound. One thing we already have achieved and where Marcos was also involved was the total synthesis of this compound. This work has been published only one week ago. So it's hot of the press in collaboration with partners from the Leibniz Institute, plant biochemistry here in Halle, the group led by Bernhard Westermann we were able to, to achieve the total synthesis of this um, compound. And this will now help us to answer other questions, like the mode of action. If we can synthesize a toxin, we can also synthesize derivatives, which might help us to study the biological activity of this compound further. So these are the two take-home matrices from the first part. I hope I could show you that old compounds that have been studied for decades can still potentially be useful if novel approaches are used. And the second take-home message is Sometimes it takes a lot of perseverance before fascinating projects take off. I thank you very much for your patience. I hope you had a little bit of fun. Um, I'm looking forward to your questions. If you have any questions afterwards, feel free to contact me.